Turn, take your Bible tonight and turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would uh, help us now. We pray that you'd bless your word. And Lord, lead us as we look at it. And we pray that your spirit would work. Lord, you'd help us against every distraction. You'd help us, Lord, against, uh, Lord, uh, all the, the, the things, Lord, that uh, might come into our mind. Um, Lord, help us to focus, and, and Lord, most of all, help us to hear, Lord, um, what you want us to hear. Uh, Lord, may it go home with us. May it help us. May we may it be on our mind this week. Um, but Lord, even more than that, uh, Lord, may it make us more like Thee. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, there are four letters in the New Testament that are addressed to uh, individuals, and um, three are to uh, young pastors, and they call those the pastoral epistles. And um, the fourth was to Philemon, and we just recently looked at that. That, that letter to Philemon um, is very personal. Um, the two letters to Timothy and Titus are very similar in a lot of ways, but there is a big difference between the two, and that is to Timothy, Paul stresses the importance of sound doctrine. But to Titus, he dwells on sound behavior. Um, and it really seems, you know, different guys, you know, they'll they'll give you the theme of the book, you know, and they'll and and everybody sometimes has a different idea on that. But but for our study, it, it really does seem that the theme of this letter is in the first verse. It talks about the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. One of the guys that I was reading when I was looking at this, he made this statement. He said, never was there a time when the necessity of being practically godly was so marked as in the days in which we live. He said that in 1947. Loose doctrine makes for loose living. But on the other hand, it is quite possible to argue uh, very strongly for the important principles of faith when the person doing the arguing is anything but consistent with their profession. Titus was a Greek and... Um, Titus was uh, somebody that he trusted, and you see that through the epistles. Um, there are three chapters in this book, and they seem to have um, sort of a natural division. Chapter one is the need of godliness in the church. Chapter two is godliness in the home. And chapter three is godliness in the world. And so we're going we're gonna to start and just... Uh, Look at the first few verses here tonight. Um, let's look at verse 1 again. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, according to, according to. Paul said, I, I am what I am by this measure. It's according to the faith of God's elect. Paul said there's a, there's a defining line. There's a measuring stick. There's there's something that identifies exactly where I stand in all of this. And he said it is the faith of God's elect. Um, anytime you bring up the word elect, it, it brings up something interesting. And, um, and I, it's, it's always needful, or, or often it is, to touch on that. And um, we're going to do that tonight, and then we'll move on 
to a couple other more truths here. But the faith of God's elect. You know, um, some people believe that that means that people are elect to salvation. They are chosen just by um, uh, a, a, an act of God that chooses some to salvation while it doesn't choose others. Um, you know, we use the word elect. We have an election. Uh, well, there's an election coming up in the States this fall. Uh, somebody, we were talking the other day, uh, there could possibly be an election up here in 2025. Um, we, we talk about elections. Um, in the U.S., when, when, when the uh, president gets elected this fall, whoever that is, He'll get elected. He'll win the election in November, but he won't officially step in August until I think sometime in January or February. So in those few months, um, he's not officially running the show. The, 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 the old guy is running the show. But he's called the president-elect. Um, you know, we use that word elect and elections and... Um, and when we use it, it means somebody has been chosen to reign. Somebody's been chosen to rule. Um, and um, that thought uh, carries through uh, the Bible also. Um, I want you to look at some verses with me. Look at Luke 19. Now, I realize... You know, when you when you when you step off into these waters, you know you're you're into some controversial territory. Although although I know how most of you think, and you know most of us are, are very like minded here tonight. Um, I'm, I might have somebody take me to task after the service, um, but um, but when you begin to look at this and you don't have a um, a preconceived idea, uh, the word elect is actually very simple in the way it the way it's handled in the scripture. Um, look at Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he, that's the Lord Jesus, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And so even as we read these words, man, you see a picture of, of us and where we are in the big scope here. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a mass message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little now watch, have thou authority over ten cities. And, you know, we're going to watch this play out in, in the millennial kingdom, okay? And, and much of our life right now is going to determine where we fit in this parable, okay? Um, verse 18. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. Look at 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Go to Revelation uh, chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. You say, Pastor, why do you always run through so many verses? And, and of course, most of you, most of you understand all that. But I'll never forget being in Bible college of all places. I remember being in Bible college and um, our professor was teaching us um, that particular class was on the, on the book of Revelation. And I remember 
the professor uh, giving us notes, and of course we had to take the notes because we were going to be tested on it. And, um, and you know what he did? Man, he just literally just, uh, there's a commentator, I believe his name is Wilmington, and uh, he literally just told us what Wilmington said. <laughs> we were there, and you had to pass the class, so we took the notes. And, um, and you know what? I'm sure Wilmington said some good things. But Wilmington is Wilmington. You know, there's a high possibility he could be wrong about a lot of things. We were talking about this uh, yesterday. Um, through the years, going to various churches, um, you know, my, my dad got saved when I was six. And so from that time on, we attended gospel preaching churches. Uh, most of them were independent Baptist. And, um, and you know, they were very similar uh, in a lot of ways. They preached some good things. They preached the gospel. They tried to win people to Christ. Um, but really, a lot of their teaching was very much like Wilmington said. <laughs> and you're just sitting there going, okay. You know, and we didn't know any better. I mean, hey, we're just, and, and, and usually that kind of teaching is often pretty dry. And, um, but when I was in my early 20s, Mitzi and I were, we hadn't been married long. Elizabeth was two years old. Mary was six months old. And um, we hit this church. And it was amazing. And the, the, um, the adult Sunday school teacher got up and uh, we, we were at that church for a year or two before we moved to another place. And he literally, he would make a statement, he would set forth a proposition, he would say something you know, from the scripture, and then he would compare scripture with scripture with scripture. And in the prophets, there's a, there's a similar thought. Um, uh, it says, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Paul talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And I'm telling you what, man, I, I grew up in, you know, I could have given you all the basics, you know, but I learned more in six months in that Sunday school class than I'd ever learned in all my years in, in church. Because he took it, he just compared scripture with scripture with scripture, and all of a sudden you, you started to see how all the pieces fit, and man, it came alive. And he wasn't trying to get a part, you know, get, get his denomination's opinion or his Bible school's opinion across, or Wilmington. He wasn't trying to do that. He was, you know when you walked away, you had a really good idea what the Bible said. What a difference. What a difference. Look at Revelation 4, verse 1. Now, I'm reading you these couple verses just so you got the context. Revelation 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Um, you know, we, um, we look at this, and, um, and you may not agree, and that's fine, but we, we look at this, and we see, the, you know, chapters 2 and 3 give the seven churches, and and all of a sudden, uh, of course, Laodicea is the last one, and it, that describes where we're at in history right now. It's the lukewarm church. It's the, the word Laodicea means the people's rights. It's a church that's not about truth. It's about you know who gets to do what and and don't hurt people's feelings, and and uh, it's the people's rights. And our society that's where our society is. And um, and all of a sudden, it closes, and a door opens in heaven. And a trumpet sounds, and it talks with me. And it says, come up hither. And man, we're caught out. And what happens, verse 2, and immediately, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne. You know where we land? We land at the throne. And you start to travel through the the these next chapter or two, and so you're you're at the throne. Look at uh, look at Revelation five, and in Revelation five you have that seven sealed book, and uh, the Apostle John is standing there, and and he's they're looking for somebody that's worthy to open the book, and they can't find anybody in heaven or earth that's worthy to open that book, and finally 
Jesus Christ steps forward and uh, he is worthy to open the book. So look at verse five, um, Revelation five, verse five. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of old odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now watch. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You know, Paul at the end of his life, we, we mentioned that this morning, Paul at the end of his life, he says, henceforth, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. And not for me only, he says. But for them also which love his appearing. You know what a crown is for? A crown is for a king. A crown is for somebody that reigns. Chosen to reign. Look at um, look at Isaiah 42. You say, Pastor, I, I think you're stretching that. That's probably not the first time you've had that thought. You know, I'm not going to fight you after the service. You know, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> I say this sweetly. Don't waste your breath. If you think elect means people are chosen salvation, God bless you. But I, I hope you do your part to win them. That's all I can say. I hope you do your part to win them. Okay. And that's fair enough. But does it always mean, does it mean that? Well, there is a verse that definitively puts a different spin on that. Look at Isaiah 42. This obviously from the context is a reference to Jesus Christ. There is no way it can be any other being in the universe. Look at Isaiah 42 verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. You know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mine elect. Did he need to get saved? Nope. Mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I will put I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. That's a ruling position. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait. For his law. Obviously. You know what Jesus Christ was chosen for? To reign. You know and. And. He is king of kings and lord of lords and. and he reigneth forever and ever. The faith of God's elect. The, the faith. Uh, Titus opens up the book. And he and he says. Uh, Paul opens up, the, excuse me, it's written to Titus. Paul opens up the book and he said, um, he said, you know, I'm an apostle and I'm a servant of God. And he said, I say that based on 
um, the fact, he said, that I have embraced the faith of God's elect. And, of course, there at the end of his life, he said, I'm going to wear a crown. Um, the faith of God's elect. The faith of God's elect. The faith of those people. Um, they are a marked people. Um, look at Colossians 2 with me. Colossians 2. There is a faith which is not the faith of God's elect. But if you're saved tonight, you have the faith of God's elect. The faith of God's elect is very specific. It's a very specific group of people. Colossians 2, verse 10, verse 9. In him, that's in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom ye also are, and here's, here it is, ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. There's an invisible mark. You know, those Old Testament Jews, um, you know, the, one of the things that they were commanded, one of the things that set them apart um, was their circumcision. And they, they were, that was the big deal. I mean, you know, who the Gentiles were, they were the uncircumcised. Um, and so there is a spiritual side to that. And we are circumcised with the circumcision without hands. We are marked by God. Look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They, and he's talking about the children of Israel, they have corrupted themselves. And it says their spot is not the spot of his children. I know we're looking at a lot of verses, but look at 2 Timothy 2 with me for a moment. 2 Timothy 2. You know, if you could see as God could see tonight, in this room, I, I trust that everybody is truly saved. I trust everybody's a believer. Uh, but if you could see as God could see tonight, um, you know, the Lord, you know, the Lord knows the ones that are his. And, um, you know, we're all sitting here and, and we, we would all say the same thing, more or less. We'd all say the same thing. Um, but not everybody that says they're God's children are God's children. And, um, but spiritually, uh, God looks down and the angels that are in this room, in this unseen world, and the devils that are in this room, uh, they know who's who. There's something about the children of God. They have a spiritual mark on them that you cannot see. Many years ago, there was a, a guy that was at a, uh, a fair you know, you know, where uh, like a county fair, downtown fair. And he was walking, you know, and going through from, uh, you know, kiosk to kiosk and booth to booth. And and uh, there was a tent there and and he was a little absent minded. And, and um, he walked into this tent. Well, what he didn't know is he had walked into the tent of a um, fortune teller. And, uh, you know, some of those people are just they're just. They don't. They don't really have any, even a demonic connection. They're just playing a game. But some of them do have a demonic connection. And he said he walked into that tent and the woman dropped her, her, her cards and she goes, oh, a man of God. Now, of course, she, she, you know what it was? It was that evil spirit in her. What did she see? That, that spirit saw something. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, a seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, at Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, uh, God says to those two particular churches that he said to him that overcometh, he would give a new name. He would give a stone. Revelation 22 verse 3, 
And it's talking about that day out there in the future where the, in the new heavens and the new earth. And it says um, that the Lord's name will be in our foreheads. The Lord's name will be in our foreheads. You know, it's interesting, this, you know, how Satan is. He counterfeits everything that is the Lord's. And, um, you know, Satan's counterfeit on earth is he puts a mark or a number in the hand or the forehead. You know, uh, in Deuteronomy 6, the children of Israel were told to take this law that had been written, and he said, you'll keep it for a sign upon your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. You know, um, the, God's children, God's true children, there, there is a, the, the faith that they have. There is a faith that they all have in common. It is the faith of God's elect. There is a faith which is not the faith of God's elect. In James 2, you don't have to turn there, but it says the devils also believe and tremble. In Acts 26, Paul looks at Agrippa and he says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And then Paul says, I know that thou believest. But was he, was he saved? No. You know, he didn't have the faith of God's elect. The faith of God's elect goes before just agreeing with, goes, it goes beyond just agreeing with something or knowing something to be true, uh, even having heartfelt feelings about it. Um, the devils believe and tremble. Randy Pike was a missionary in South Africa, in Australia for many years, and uh, he's with the Lord now. And um, um, Brother Clint, his, his home church there in, in Lacombe, they, they've uh, had a lot of dealings with Brother Randy Pike through the years. And Brother Randy Pike said, and I'm just telling you the story, okay? I'm not recommending this stuff. I, I've never done anything like this. I don't hunt for this. I don't want this, okay? But, um, but he said he, he wound up in a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a situation, there was a, Somebody that had a loved one and they were genuinely devil possessed. I mean, match the Bible description, you know, frothing at the mouth and the whole nine yards. And, and um, he said, so we began to deal with that woman. Uh, um, the family wanted us to come and see if we could do something. And, um, and you know, I will say this, an, an, a missionary, an old missionary told me this. He said, he said, I do not believe. And I think it's very evident. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that we have the authority that the apostles had because the apostles could raise the sick, raise the dead and heal the sick. And they could do it left, right and center. And part of that ball of wax was they had power over evil spirits. I don't believe we have that. Um, I want to come back to Randy Pike because I'm going to really jump the rail here. But Ted Mullins, a uh, missionary, you've heard his name. Some of you know, brother Ted, um, retired missionary in the jungles of New Guinea. He said one day they, they walked into a hut uh, and there was there was a man there where they were way up in the in, in the jungle, and he said this guy again matched the Bible picture of demon possession, devil possession. He was in convulsions on his bed. He was frothing at the mouth, and um, and Ted said, he said uh, he said I know. He said I don't have the authority the apostles had. He said I know that. He said so. What we did was he said it was I and the native pastor. And he said, we went there to witness to this guy, try to win him to Christ. He said, we walk in the hut, he's in convulsions, and he's frothed at the mouth. He said, so we got, we, we, we got on our knees and we prayed. And we said, Lord, we are here to talk to him about Jesus Christ. We're to talk to him about you, Lord. Would you please cause him to come into his right mind and, and get that devil quiet? So that we can talk to him. He said immediately. Immediately. He was calm. He said we witnessed him. You know. Took him to the plan of salvation. You know. Showed him his need. The whole nine yards. And he said we. We came to the end of what we were doing. And we said. Would you like to receive Jesus Christ now? And he said. No. I'm not ready. And he said immediately. He was back in convulsions. And foaming at the mouth. 
Randy Pike said this, this, uh, they got asked to go see this lady and, and he said, um, he said, man, they started talking to her and he said, suddenly another voice came out of her body and was just, he said it took hours. You see, um, and, and God allowed them to do it, but you know, in the Bible it didn't take, it didn't take any of them hours because they had the authority to do it. But he said, we, 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 we began to read scripture to this lady and he said, um, he said, we began to read scripture about the lake of fire and the final destination of Satan. Now, get it. And he said, suddenly the devil screamed out of her. And he said, she covered her ears and she said, no, no, that's our final destination. No. The devils believe. The devils believe and tremble. You know, you can believe and tremble and not have the faith of God's elect. The faith of God's elect is something that you have grabbed on to Jesus Christ and no conditions, no game. You're holding on to Him. You're turning to Him once and for all and forever. You're hanging your hope for heaven on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And it changes you forever. It changes you forever. Look at 1 John 5. 1 John 5. The devils believe. Well, I think there's some people in some of our churches, you know, they, you know, you know, the only way, only way you can explain it is something, something's missing. Something's missing. You know, I, I understand that some people can get away from the Lord. You, you have the church at Corinth. And you know some of the things that were going on there, you know, and terrible things that people can people can get away from the Lord and, and all that. We you know we we certainly understand that. But in any church, you you you've got people, and they 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 say they all believe the same thing, and yet and yet in a lot of those churches. If you were there over a 10 year period, some of those people that prayed and witnessed and did all that stuff, one day, you know, you walk in and they're gone. And, uh, and today, I heard it two or three this week. Today, they don't even believe in God. You know what? They believe something. The devils believe and tremble, but the devil gets no new life. The devil's going to get no new life. Look at 1 John 5, verse 1, the faith of God's elect. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, if, if you love God, he loveth him also that is begotten of him. If you love God, you love his children. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Why is it that some of these people, they walk away and today they don't even believe in God? Why is it that they have assimilated themselves back into the world and quite comfortably? You know, what was missing is, was their faith. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. You know, this thing of, of what the faith of God's elect is, is um, we have... You know, we, we don't have any trouble believing certain people, but 
But the faith of God's elect is they believe the witness of God. They believe what God has said. For this is the witness, verse 9, which of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So the faith of God's elect, they believe God. They believe God above any man, anywhere. Uh, they believe what God said about his Son. Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. You know, the, the faith of God's elect, the people that, that really say, that really know the Lord, they really believed on the Lord. You know, they, they can see some things. I mean, and they don't even see him with their eyes, but they see them afar off. And man, they, they're just certain that God's going to keep his word that everything's going to turn out just like God said. And I mean, they're more sure of that than they are of sunrise tomorrow morning. I mean, you can't talk them out of it, and you're certainly not going to get them to believe some wacko nonsense anywhere, and they're not going to give it all up just because trouble comes their way. They've seen something, okay? Verse 13, having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They done gave up on this place. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. The faith of God's elect. Man, they're, they're, uh, they're looking for a better place. And um, they're, they're excited about that place. They're banking on it. They're living for that. Uh, they're seeking a better place. Uh, look at verse 34. Verse 34. I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 34. The faith of God's elect. Hebrews 10, verse 34. For he had compassion of me, Paul said, in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven, knowing in your in yourselves, they weren't worried about their loss, because way down deep inside, they knew they have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. You know, it's not just something they say they, they believe and they agree with everybody. And it's not even something maybe even they're convinced of, you know. But but it's it's you know, it's 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 the it's the way they live. It's something inside them. They they have put their trust in Jesus Christ and in eternal things. And the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Look at Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto, us, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith 
in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. I know that some people struggle with assurance, and I, I realize that this passage is dealing with more than just assurance. But um, Paul said, our gospel came not in word only, but also in power and I better look it up. I'm going to misquote that. My brain just glitched. Yeah, it's in much assurance. That's where I'm going. For our gospel came not into you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. You know, I know, um, I, I do I, I do understand that sometimes people struggle with some of this. Um, some people are just confused, you know, um, maybe because they're, they're, they're really trying to recapture a memory somewhere or something like that, and that gets really foggy. But all I know is our gospel came not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. We which have believed do enter into rest. I remember what it was like for years to grow up in church and just be tormented by no assurance. But the night I got saved, I entered into rest. Man, I believed to the saving of the soul. And I knew that I had crossed that line and I had everlasting life. They which believe enter into rest. I, I have a friend of mine and I listened to his testimony. He was one of those you know, kids that grew up in church and, and, um, and he said he wrestled with that, you know, and, um, and he said he would go through these bouts where he, he really couldn't figure it out. And he said, one day he came to the place where he really got desperate with the Lord and he was wrestling about this thing of his assurance. And, um, and he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, I don't know what to do. He said, Lord, I've done everything they told me to do. They told me to call her name. They told me to ask. Lord, you know, I've asked you to save me up teen times. Uh, Lord, I, I believe you died on the cross and all that stuff, you know. And, and But he was just really, really, I mean, you know, it's always a dangerous thing when you're looking for a feeling. But boy, there there is something to assurance. And I, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's rest. It's rest. And finally, he came to the place where he said to God, he said, Lord Jesus. He said, maybe I'm going to go to hell. But he said, if I go to hell, he said, I just want you to know, Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you. <laughs> and he said, when I said those words, whoa, he said, I had peace. Because he said, I came to the place where I wasn't going to worry about it anymore. I was just going to trust Jesus Christ. And you know what that is? That's salvation. That's salvation. The faith of God's elect. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. First Thessalonians 2, and you know, we, we just read this verse uh, recently, but I want you to see it again. First Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Man, the word of God, it, some people, it just has a dramatic effect on them. And, and, and you know, he's, uh, he's writing to believers here. And uh, he said, you know, when we preach the word of God, he said, you received it. He said, like it really is. He said, you, you didn't receive it as the word of men. 
you received it as the word of God. And when you receive it that way, um, when you believe it, it works in you and it produces an effect. It works effectually. So the faith of God's elect, you know, it's, it's that faith in Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. It's the savior. It's, it's a book. It's a book. You received it. When you heard the word of God, you received it. It's the word of God. It's, it's about eternity. And Paul said, I'm an apostle. He said, I'm a servant of God. And he said, and my identifying mark is that the faith that I live and the faith that I preach, he said, it is this faith. Look at, um, look at Jude chapter 1. Jude 1 verse 3, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, you know, that's sort of another way of saying the same thing. He said, he said, you know, we've all got the same salvation. It all operates the same way. You know, everybody's experience and everybody's emotional thing about how they received it. You know, some people laugh and some people cry and some people are just finally at rest. And, you know, there's, you know, the, the whole thing, there's a lot of differences. Our personalities are all that stuff. But it is the common salvation. Um, it's, it's, it all comes from the same place. It's from believing the same thing. It produces the same effect. He said, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. The faith of God's elect. And the faith of God's elect is the whole ball of wax. Um, Luke 24, Jesus has just risen from the dead and he's walking back on the road to Emmaus and he's got uh, those uh, two disciples with him. And of course, they don't know who he is. And, um, and Jesus says, why are, you, why are you so sad? And they said, are you a stranger in these parts? Have you not heard what happened? And, and so they begin to tell Jesus about what happened to him. And, um, and Jesus looks at them and he says, oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. To believe all. You know, the, the faith of God's elect is, is um, man, when you meet God's people, wherever they are, if they have this faith, you know, you know the thing is, they just, they just believe it all. I mean, they, they might not understand it all. He didn't say, oh, fools and slow of heart to understand. That's not what he said. He said, oh, fools. Oh, slow of heart to believe all. We, we may not understand it all. We may not have it all figured out. You know, we may differ on some explanations about this and that, the other. But we believe it. Look at 2 Peter 3. You're just back up a page or two. You'll hit 2 Peter 3. We believe it all. Second Peter three, verse fifteen, uh, verse fourteen. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long suffering of our Lord. He's talking about uh, how the Lord has waited before his coming. He said the conclusion you need to draw is that God still wants to save some people. Okay, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now watch, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now it's interesting that Peter would say that. You know, you think if anybody would understand, another fellow apostle would say it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I, I know some pastors he's probably talking about. You know, I'm thinking, you know, there's some passages that Paul has written 
you know, and you're going, oh, you know, and you, you look at him and you sort of have a general idea. And he said this, verse 16, as also in all his appeals, epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. He said there's people that they, you know, they handle the scriptures and they, they teach the scriptures. Paul talked about some of those that they really had no idea what they were teaching. And he said, uh, Peter said here that they, there are people that they rest, they twist the scriptures. You know, um, we may not understand it all, but we believe it all. And we don't want to twist it. You know, um, there's things in this book that are uh, still a mystery to us. You know, uh, when the angel showed up to Daniel, and Daniel said, can you, can you explain this to me? And uh, man, the, the Lord, Lord blessed him and let him understand much of that. But it is, it's the bottom line is there's, we walk by faith and, um, and it is the faith of God's elect. And I just, just the last statement, Romans one, and we're done. Romans one. That believing that faith, the faith of God's elect, it, it brings a life with it. Look at Romans 1, verse 3. It's talking about the gospel, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. You know, that the faith of God's elect, um, it, it brings, it brings a life with it. You know, it's, it's, um, and I, you're, you're, you, you guys understand all this stuff. Um, I'm, I don't think anything that I have said tonight is anything new. Um, but you know, the, the thing we have in common, there's a lot we don't have in common. Man, our, our backgrounds are different. Our church backgrounds are different. You know, our, uh, just there's so many things that are so different about us. But um, you know what makes God's people tick? It's that faith that's inside of them. We walk by faith, and that faith causes something to happen. They, faith causes desires. And where we're going, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, the, the acknowledging uh, the... Um, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. And the book of Titus is about that, that behavior that it produces. And you know what it does? If you follow the Lord, now you can get away from the Lord. But if you follow the Lord, if you, if you, you're trying to walk with the Lord, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you care about, and if you, He's really in you, you know what there is? There's something inside of you. You, you believe what He said and you hear it and you want to do it. I mean, you might you might struggle. We're we all struggle, and there's going to be battles. And uh, but you know what? You're going to make decisions this week. You're you're gonna you're gonna say some things this week, and you're not going to say some things this week, and you're going to do some things, and you're not going to do. And you know why that is? Because you believe God's watching. You believe God is is right there in your life. You believe the Holy Ghost. You believe. You believe. You believe. You know what that is? That's the faith of God's elect. You know what's missing in the in the people that don't? They just they just they, they don't want to live it. You know, they, they like church as a social event. And they like church people. But you know what? They're they're not they're not in this thing for, for a life. You know why that is? They don't know God. They believe like the devils believe. And they may even really be convinced that a lot of this is really true. But you know what? They haven't embraced it with all their heart. So if you've got that faith of God's elect tonight, uh, man, you know what? I would just tell you tonight, just, just thank God for what He's done in your heart. And um, keep feeding that faith. And um, if you don't have it, if you don't know what we're talking about tonight, uh, you know what? You can have it. 
For by grace are you saved through faith. But it's this deal where you're going to latch onto it. And there's, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Lord, bless your people tonight, Father. Thank you, God, for making this thing by faith and through faith, Lord. Lord, I pray wherever you spoke to anyone tonight, Lord, I pray they do business with you. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him? Thank you for your truth. Bless now, Lord, as we go our ways. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Amen.